Hi, everybody. This is Raquel Fleskis and Dr. Theodore Schur. We're coming to you remotely from the University of Pennsylvania, and we're really excited to be here today to kind of give you a research update on all the things we've been working on over this past year. Um, my name again, like I said, is Raquel Pleskis. I am a graduate student, a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania studying molecular genetics and ancient DNA. I've been primarily working on the ancient DNA of this project, so that is extracting DNA of the Anson Street ancestors to try to understand ancestry and how they relate to each other. Um, I'm here with Dr. Theodore Schur, and he can introduce himself. I am indeed Theodore Schur, and I'm a professor of anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania uh, with a background in biological anthropology and genetics. And I'm working with Raquel Fleskis on the analysis of genetic variation in, in past and present uh, African-American populations of Charleston. Well, thank you guys so much for having us today. Um, today, we're going to give you about a list, short overview, about five to 10 minutes about all the work we've been doing. We're going to talk about, kind of give you guys an update on the DNA research. Um, we're really close to publishing our first paper from this project. Um, so we're going to kind of give you a sneak preview of, of all of the research, preliminary research summaries um, that we've been working on. We're also going to, Tad will be talking about the significance of the work in relation to Charleston's history. Um, and we're also going to talk about future work to come. So future things we're interested in learning about the Anson Street ancestors, things like diet and whole genome ancestry. So we'll get to that in more detail. Before we begin on the DNA research, I just want to, Tad and I just want to say a big thank you to the Gullo Society for involving us in this research project, the City of Charleston for making it possible, the National Geographic Society for funding this research, as well as the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Tennessee, specifically Dr. Graciela Cabana, for hosting this research project in her ancient DNA lab. So without all of these people and so many more people, we just unfortunately don't have time to mention and go and Tad, maybe we'll go into more detail with, we wouldn't be able to do it without you. Without you. Um, and also, most importantly, we're really grateful for the community um, in this research. So without your guys' support, this wouldn't be happening. Um, so we wish we could be there in person to talk to you about this today, but unfortunately, in light of COVID. Um, and also, last but not least, we're really grateful to the ancestors, the 36, for allowing us to um, learn about them, about who they were, and about other African descended persons in 18th century Charleston. So we want to acknowledge um, and give gratitude to them and to their spirit um, that makes this research possible. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to give you guys a little bit of a kind of overview of the DNA research since we, um, since we talk, to you talk to you next. So this is kind of an overview of the Anson Street African Burial Project. So here we have laid out our both our scientific research goals and our community engagement research goals. We put them together because we feel that they are very interweaved with each other. Um, we focused on a interdisciplinary research strategy. So combining things such as ancient DNA, interpreting those results alongside the osteology, archaeology, and strontium isotopes, which I'll go into more detail about. And we took this strategy because we wanted to focus on the biohistories of these burials, of these individuals. And so what I mean about biohistories is trying to uncover what, who these people were, you know, were they men, women, children, where they may have come from, using all of these different scientific techniques. We're trying to reconstruct these individuals whom unfortunately we don't have any documentary information about. So first, um, and, and so we can see here in the middle, this is our kind of overview of the burial ground. You can kind of see here each of one of these little rectangles is one burial. You can see that they're placed into four relatively perpendicular and equally spaced rows. Each individual only contained one grave. So and one individual buried within, and they're all kind of facing the east-west direction. So this suggests to us 
that we, people were buried over a long period of time and also with care. Um, and this connects with kind of our archaeology field of study led by Dr. Eric Poplin and Rockington Research Associates. So when the 36 were uncovered, um, when the burials were exhumed, they also did a very thorough archaeological analysis of the grave artifacts that were found, such as this glass bead that was found with Omo, um, an 18 month year old child. So this little black glass bead was found in near the cranium or her head. So it may suggest that it was a hair ornament. So things, artifacts such as these glass beads um, help us kind of understand the lifehood, the life ways of these individuals, how care and personal expression. Um, so these are types of things that we go into into the article to kind of talk about what were their lived experiences like. In addition, we find artifacts such as this George III 1773 halfpenny. Um, this is a really interesting artifact because it, it gives us a date for the site. We are able to see very closely on this bottom here, it says 1773, so this allows us to date the site. This, along with documents and plat records, dates the, per the period of interment to around 1760 AD to 1790 AD. This is about a 30 year period of internment. So this alongside their kind of our burial artifacts and the burial rows and spacing suggests that internment occurred over a long period of time by an active community, living community. Now we also interpreted our archeology span alongside the osteology. So this is the study of the kind of the, the skeletons that remained in the burials. We partnered with Dr. Susan Abel and Dr. Wolf Bookschen, who are dental anthropologists and bioarchaeologists who are able to kind of look at the bones to try to understand what uh, age they are. So if they are adult category or sub-adult. So we find infants, children, and adolescents at the burial ground. We also find though a lot of adults. So a majority of people buried at Anson Street are of the adult age. Um, unfortunately, preservation was a little bit poor, so we were able to deduce that we have some kind of a little bit greater majority of males, but many that were unidentified, but future genomic analyses will be able to try to identify the sexes of these individuals, and we'll go into more detail about that later. So other things that osteology helped us look at is kind of pa patterns in dental wear. So, you know, a couple individuals had modified dental incisors. So these are kind of shaved or purposely modified teeth that sometimes are reflective uh, for ritual purposes and practice in Sub-Saharan Africa. Or also we find individuals with teeth that have modifications reflective of an activity induced dental wear. So that's something where you're using your teeth repeatedly over and over again, and it causes a little bit of wear on the teeth. So we're able to look at the teeth to try to understand what were these people doing during their lives? Did they like to smoke tobacco pipes? We find some people with wear fastest little circles in their teeth where a pipe would have been placed. So we integrate that information holistically alongside our other evidence. So, and that brings us to our third point, our strontium isotopes. We collaborated with um, uh, Dr. Chelsea Juarez at NC State, um, and she's currently at the University of California at Fresco, um, to do strontium stable isotope analysis. So this analysis is really important for us to understand residence patterns of the Anson Street individuals. So what I mean by residence patterns is where were these individuals born? and where, how long were they living in, the, air, in uh, the Charleston area before they passed away. So we can look at strontium, which is a chemical uh, uh, that is absorbed into both your enamel during your developmental years, right? So when you're growing your enamel, but also in your bone, in your cortical bone. It absorbs um, and your bone is actually remodel every 10 years. So when we look at cortical bone, this reflects the last 10 years um, of your life versus enamel, which reflects your developmental, so your, your childhood. So we looked at two different areas. And what strontium does is basically the ratio of strontium that is absorbed in your enamel and in your cortical bone matches the geographical area that that person was living in. 
right? So we looked both at West African ranges and ranges within Charleston to see how does this match with our enamel values and our cortical bone values. And we found that with enamel, so enamel is the childhood, that the strontium matched ranges found in West Africa for about half of the individuals. So this means about half of the individuals were born in West Africa. Now this differs with our bone values, which is the last 10 years of our life, right? And we find it's mostly blue, right? So this would mean that most individuals were living in Charleston for a significant period of their life before passing away. So the strontium isotopes is really important for us to try to understand, you know, how long were people in Charleston for? Um, were most of these first or second generation African descended persons? And for it seems like for those interred at Anson Street, many are second generation and all, but also long term residents of Charleston. Now, lastly, we interpret the ancient DNA within the context of these three other fields our interdisciplinary research strategy. So what we did was that we extracted DNA from teeth and from petrous bone, which is kind of your inner ear bone, um, which contains really good levels of DNA. And we extracted uh, mitochondrial DNA. So we have two different types of DNA in our body, right? So here we have a little DNA icon um, on the upper left, right? We have our 23 chromosomes and our sex chromosomes. Those is what is called our whole genome. And then we also have our mitochondrial DNA or mitogenome, as seen right here, which is reflective of our maternal ancestry. So we were successfully able to characterize the mitogenomes of 31 out of the 36 individuals. Now the results are here. So we're going to see a bunch of letters and numbers. Um, and what we, and these basically are called haplogroups. Now we won't go into the super detailed science and how to you know, how to kind of dissect a haplogroup, but quick hand for everybody to take away is that we see that there's a lot of L types here, right? So L, anything that starts with an L has origins within Africa. So a vast majority of individuals found at Af in Anson Street had African mitochondrial DNA haplogroups. And these haplogroups are found mostly in West and Central Africa, which corresponds to our understanding of the patterns of the transatlantic slave trade. But you also see here that we have a U6 and an H100. These are not L types, but they are also uh, from populations living in Africa. So these are also African mitochondrial haplogroups. Interestingly, we have this A2 type, which you can see right here, found with one person. This is a little bit different than all the other African haplogroups because A2 is actually found in North America. It's an indigenous North American haplotype. So this was a little bit of a surprise for us when we came across this result and, wants, and probes us to think about the role of indigenous persons in Charleston during this time. And this is a part of our research strategy that we're going to be exploring more in the future. What is the extent of indigenous ancestry at the, of, within the Anson Street ancestors? Also importantly, two individuals shared the same mitochondrial DNA haplogroup. So they shared the same mutations in their mitochondrial DNA. Now, when that happens, it suggests that they share direct maternal ancestry. The two individuals with the same mitogenome haplogroups is Walela and Isi. Walela is a 68-year-old child, and Isi is an adult female. They are found right here in this kind of northwest area of the burial ground, buried right next to each other. Given also the burial context and other burial artifacts, we think that they may be maternally related. But we're going to be doing more whole genome, so that looks at your 23 chromosomes, right, your biparental ancestry, to probe into the extent of this relationship. So it does seem that we do see a little bit of biological relatedness between these individuals, but also with the archaeology, lots of connections between both between individuals and between the living community that interred them. 
So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to Dr. Theodore Schur for kind of his takeaways and the importance of this research. Thank you, Raquel. So what I'd like to do now um, on this anniversary of the reinterment of the ancestry to ancestors is to reflect on the work uh, that has been undertaken to return the ancestors to the burial site in May of last year and then the results of our interdisciplinary research into their lives, which Raquel has provided a very nice overview uh, on. So as I mentioned before, I'm a, I'm a uh, Theodore Sherman, a biological anthropologist and geneticist at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, one of the scientific investigators for the Ancestry Ancestors Burial Ground Project, as, as Raquel indicated. So she and I have been involved in directing and undertaking the DNA studies that are part of this project. So after carefully removing the remains of the ancestors from the ground in 2013, our research team led by the Gullah Society has spent seven years examining the osteological, isotopic, and genetic characteristics of these individuals to learn more about their lives and experiences of enslaved persons of African ancestry in 18th century Charleston. Being a landmark study in anthropological genetics and African American history, the results of this scientific investigation are noteworthy for a number of reasons. First, they represent one of the most comprehensive studies of African descended persons from this time period that has ever been undertaken, with more research about their lives to be forthcoming in the next two years. That work includes the, the larger genomic analysis that Raquel has mentioned to you, as well as analysis of dental calculus and, uh, and uh, microbiome information, which will provide details about the health and diet of, of the ancestors. So as a consequence of their involvement in this research, the ancestors will make a significant contribution to our understanding of African-American history in Charleston, South Carolina, and the United States more broadly. Second, despite these burials being forgotten, unmarked on flat maps, and built upon through subsequent development, we are able to use our data from this study to illuminate their lives and, and demand acknowledgement of their presence in Charleston to which they contributed through their forced labor. Their lives have been made visible through our collaborative research efforts. Third, in addition to expanding our knowledge of African-American history in Charleston, this project has introduced the ancestors to the rest of the world and let anyone interested in this history learn more about them through our public uh, presentations and research articles. This is very important because of the global nature of the transatlantic slave trade and the ramifications of the African diaspora that can continue to affect American society today. Finally, our work with the ancestors has allowed us to, to, to also work collaboratively with the African American community, contemporary folks, and, and integrate their perspective and interest into the research. In a real sense, this engagement has fostered a conversation between past and present generations of African Americans. Using the we have generated in this study, Charlestonian participants have been able to explore their ancestry and heritage in new ways. To conclude my part of this, this discussion, uh, we are extremely grateful to the ancestors for providing this extraordinary opportunity to learn more about their lives and hope that they will rest in peace knowing that we have worked diligently and respectfully to tell their stories to the best of our ability using the research tools that are presently available to us. So with that, again, maybe what I will do is iterate our, reiterate our, our, our thanks to the Gullah Society, to the city of Charleston, uh, the College of Charleston, the University of Pennsylvania, the National Geographic Society, and all of the uh, funders who helped and other supporters who helped make this work possible. This is truly a unique uh, a research project and a, and a chance to, to delve into Charlestonian history in, in, a, in new ways. And uh, we believe that this will have, this work will have a great impact for both con for today and also for people and future generations uh, in, in Charleston and other places in this country. Thank you so much for having us and please enjoy this day um, safely and virtually um, as we commemorate the ancestry ancestors. Mm -hmm.